Today's dating landscape is tough enough as it is. You don't need to add extra stress to your quest for love by putting pressure on your performance in the bedroom. If you need that extra confidence to impress your new special friend, Blue Chew is here to help. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code HOLLY, to receive your first month for free. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, my guest is an Avian Award winning performer who I've had the pleasure of shooting for Twisties. And I'm so excited to get to know her more today. Let's welcome Anna Claire Clouds. Hi, thank you for having me. You're so welcome. <laughs> thank you for coming. I'm very excited. You know, we unfortunately only got to shoot that one time, but I have to say, I really liked you and I really liked your energy. And so I was like, I should have her. On the show, I feel like she would have good things to say. You know how, like, you can just tell, you yeah, know, it's like very, with someone. Mm-hmm. It's so very don't easy. disappoint me. <laughs> <laughs> I will try my best not to. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a really fun day. Mona was wonderful, and working for Twisties was great because you know mm-hmm. they provided quite a bit of the ability to like build something beautiful. Mm-hmm. Like the wardrobe was great. The set was great. Stella, awesome. Mm-hmm. Loved having Stella there. It was my first time meeting her. And mm-hmm. so it was a great day. I yeah. absolutely loved it. Yeah, that was uh, a good day. Um, it's crazy. You heard the news that um, Twisties, which is part of Mind Geek, which I talk about all the time, sold to another company. Yeah. I, I don't know yeah. how to feel about it or who the company is. Yeah. So they're a private equity firm. Um, and they're run by like lawyers and like a former, there's a, like a former policeman, I think that's in the part of the company. So it's like, I know, right? So everyone's like super interesting, but don't know if I love it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, th- I talked to some people at MindGeek uh, today and like I expected, they're like, look, nothing's going to change. Um, and it's just like, it's a very sensationalist, like, you know article and PR you know the oh, okay. PR is like I mean everybody like thinks it's hilarious yeah absolutely. um my brother sent me my brother who does not work in the adult industry um sent me like a screen grab of a tweet by someone who said like uh Pornhub which you know is part of Mind Geek, but um is not specifically just Mind Geek, yes. was just bought by a company called um ethical I'm going to tell you right now. Hold on. I'm going to find the tweet. I'm so find a tweet. Pornhub, which is not connect, which is not its own entity, was... Yeah, I mean, it just, like, for headlines, <laughs> it's this great, sounds it's great so much PR. better, it's right? It's incredible PR. So, what's, here it is. Uh, Pornhub was just acquired by private equity firm Ethical Capital Partners. You can't make this shit up. And I was just like, look, I get that from, like, a sensationalist point of view, from, like, a clickbait title, like, that's, that's a great tip clickbait title and I understand that people not in the industry like think that that's like crazy but I will say that for somebody who's worked for Mind Geek for like over a decade who's seen them go through a lot of changes the the situation that happened with Pornhub I won't get into it because we all know about it Mm -hmm. um was terrible super unfortunate um you know never should have happened in the first place Mm-hmm. But without getting into all of that, I will say that the people who are now working at Mind Geek, it's a compl- that was like ten years ago. Yeah. It's like a completely different set of people, and they are very different than they used to be, even like five years ago. Um, and I will say that I truly believe that right now they're like the most ethical company in the yeah. oil industry. I Absolutely. really, I know how Pornhub started. I know it started as a tube site. It stole everybody's content. Like I get that. Like yes. But the way that they've they've changed it and the way nobody supports, supports the adult industry financially or from a PR perspective more than Pornhub does, no. more than MindGeek does. No one treats their contract stars better. No one treats their directors better. No one pays more fairly. Exactly. I've worked for fucking everyone. And so, like, and I'm trying to explain this to my brother, and he's just like... <laughs> 
and these regulations it, for these companies are kind of a little bit of a gray area because yeah. we are adult and there's not necessarily like you said there's not great pr there's not really there's not a labor union even like a yeah. real one there's yeah. nothing that it's so it's difficult it was probably very difficult for pornhub to navigate but i like you said i have full faith in them too yeah. they are the only company that I know when I'm working for them. Well, not the only company, but they are definitely one of the companies that I know when I'm working for them, they are going to tell me exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And nothing is going to change from that. Yeah. Like, I'm going to know what I'm wearing, even a picture of what I'm wearing. Like, yeah. they're, they're extremely ethical in their practices and how they treat their performers. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say, like, if you don't get that information, that's the fault of probably the producer or the director, mm, yeah. not them specifically, because I know that they deliver that information to us. Yes. And that was one of my biggest issues with working for some other companies. Like, there were some companies that literally the night before the shoot, I would be begging them for the information. I'm like, I'm shooting tomorrow. My call time is 8 a.m. What the fuck am I doing for you? Like, I don't know. Where I just am know I even going to go? It's like, I know it's like two girls and a guy, but you haven't given me a concept. You don't, I don't know what she wants. She's wearing. I don't know what we're doing. Like, what are we doing? Like, I have to tell people this. Like, I like to send out call sheets minimum a week in advance, have all the information in there. I hate surprises. I hate it when people show up to set and they're like, what are we doing today? And then like, oh, I don't want to do that. I never want to be in that situation. Absolutely. For you, it's really difficult too because you are trying to get information from them and then you have a lot of other people on the line. Yeah, like, who are like, me, what am I doing who tomorrow? Who is contacting someone else, who is contacting someone else, who has oh, – uh, light people like yeah. everything it's, it's so infuriating <laughs> you're and just I'm trying just, to figure it out <laughs> yeah and i'm just like where where are you like <laughs> what, are you running a business like what what is going on here and if you book a location like without a pool and it's a pool scene uh, yes yes that's great that's the other thing too <laughs> so it's like fun. it's like and then they'll be like oh let me let me give you this scene where like you know a girl comes in and she like sneaks and she like peers through the window in the kitchen of like the girl baking. I'm like, okay, does the kitchen have a shootable window? Like, <laughs> yeah. can I put somebody out there without like the neighbors seeing everything? Like, is is there an angle that works right for this? Like, there's so many little things that come into play that like I have to be prepared for, and I have to book locations according specifically to how the script goes. Mm -hmm. And I just like I don't understand how many times I have to fucking tell people that it's maddening. There's like two or three houses in the valley that have floor to ceiling windows. Yeah. And there's, I think, two or three times that I've shot at those houses. And they've said, okay, the whole movie is at nighttime. <laughs> so we're going to have to figure out how to black out all these windows. And it's <sighs> it's eight in the morning. I'm there in hair and makeup. And I'm like, okay, not, yeah. not my job. Do and I'm know? so grateful. Do you know how much duvetine that is? <laughs> so much. So so much duvetine. Oh my god! And duvetine's heavy. It's fucking expensive. Like, how are you gonna hang that? What are you gonna hang that from? You gonna drill nails or a beam? You gonna install a beam in the wall? Fuck no, you're not. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Like, so then you're gonna have to go get um like this. Uh, there's like this special um like blackout. Uh, there's sheeting that you can get, but like you have to have all of those things yes. on you. And then again, how are you gonna attach it? Tape's gonna fall off. Like, is it raining outside? Like. They were very. Are there skylights? Do you have to climb on the fucking roof? Yeah, exactly. and cover the skylights. Yes, exactly. Yes. Like exactly. Who's going up there? We couldn't do we shoot have in a, a certain room because there was skylights. Yeah. Like, do we? Or do we have a ladder that's going to get us up there? Probably not. Do we have someone who's like willing to risk breaking their fucking no. neck to go up on the roof to cover the skylight? Probably not. Absolutely. Does not. the comp Does the production company have like? Workers' comp insurance? Probably not. <laughs> no. Sean, who uh, I'm going to shout out Sean. He is the best light guy in the industry. We love Sean. And we Sean love actually. Sean. We love Sean. And Sean sometimes watches my YouTube channel. And it's very funny to see him pop in sometimes and be like, that's me. Yeah, no, that's because that's him because he's incredible. He is the best in the business. He does so well. We had a shoot one day. <laughs> it was for Seth Gamble as well. We were talking about him a little bit earlier. And he. Uh, he had to make it slightly dark outside. No, all the way dark outside with rain coming in. And it was on a, like, clear door. So you had to see the rain on the door. You had to see the rain behind us. And it had to be dark. And it was, like, 11 in 
the morning. Yeah. It was 11. It was before noon. Yeah. And it was a beautiful day and <laughs> yeah. beautiful day in LA. So it was really, really difficult. But he did it in 15 minutes, probably. That's he got amazing. it. He's so good. He, it was an idea that Seth had that he hadn't like fully, he said, I really want to do this. I don't know if we can. And Sean yeah. said, okay. I'll make it work. And how he they, made it work. Had they did someone stand out there with a hose and like spray the yeah, door? Yeah, one of the grips stood out there with a hose and sprayed the door. It was really, really good. It was yeah. a wonderful scene. It was, and Sean like that's what people kinda I think also don't understand about the industry too, is there's a lot of hands in it, mm-hmm. including people like Sean, who are the absolute best in their field and I I don't think I've ever met someone even on a mainstream set that was as good at lighting as Sean. Like yeah. he's good. Yeah. He's good. So there's people in our industry that are the best in their field and they stay because they're just good at what they do and they like earning money this way in yeah. a very open environment. Yeah. Yeah. And um yeah, it's funny because there's like very few grips that are good and mm-hmm. So the everyone in the industry is fighting for them, and Sean's, like, definitely one of them. Like, to book Sean is so hard. He's booked to the end of the year right now. Yeah, yeah. I believe it. I believe it. It's just, like... He said that in January. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. People, like... I mean, I've talked... It's funny, because Casey Calvert and I talk about this a lot, because she, you know, she always wants him for her movies. She's like, I will book my movies around his availability. <laughs> It's pretty funny. So you're not going to get a movie done. I'm so sorry, Casey. She probably I already you. booked I him. love you so much, Casey. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Booked him for 2024. Yeah. <laughs> like, for sure. Yeah. He's probably a part of the people that are booked for this year. Yes. Most likely. Yes. Last year in November, she yes. got it in. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> Anyways, so let's let's start from the beginning. Um, how did you get into the adult industry? I got into the adult industry in kind of an interesting way. Um I started by doing modeling, and I did, like, a lot of modeling that would work for short girls. So, boudoir. How um, tall are you? I'm 5'1". Okay. Like, 5'1 and a half-ish. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm taking that half-inch. <laughs> <laughs> you take that half-inch! You take it! It makes me feel so big. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, so... I was doing modeling and a lot of stuff like that, and I actually worked with a creator, a creator who is a comedian, and... Back, this is back when Vine allowed nudity. Oh, my God. Yeah. Vine. I was talking to somebody about that the other day. That <laughs> that doesn't exist in any form whatsoever no. anymore, right? Mm-mm. Not at all. That, I mean, that was the original TikTok. It was. And they allowed nudity and really, really fun content. And they didn't make it 15 seconds and then three minutes and then 10 minutes. They You stuck to the – you only got 10 seconds. That's all you get. Yeah. That's as much as you're going to get. Yeah. So the comedy had to be really fast and really quick. And I worked with a creator who had paid me for a photo shoot to work together um, at one point. And we just continued working together and collaborating, making those little videos. And he had a premium Snapchat. And he said, I think you would do really good at it. Uh, you have a following and, you know, you don't get naked anywhere. Other than with me, just a little a little bit of titty isn't a big mm-hmm. deal. So I started a premium Snapchat, and overnight I made, I think, $10,000, and I was able to quit my job and reinvest that money into starting a business that helped girls sell premium Snapchats. Kept going with that. Um, that must have blown your fucking mind. It did. It absolutely did. I... <sighs> That same day that I decided to start it, I had gotten a call from my manager who called me and said, I need you to come in. Someone hasn't come in. And I was working at a restaurant okay. as a server. She said, I need you to come in. Um, we, we have an 18 top. It was a really nice restaurant. They needed somebody there. And I said, I, I can't. I'm 45 minutes away. There's no way I can do that. And she proceeded to yell at me and just degrade me in the a way a professional person can, but saying, like, you don't take your job seriously. This could be blah, 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 blah. Anything that you could say. And that evening I was like, you know what? I've been thinking about this. Let me just see. What's the worst that can happen? And I had a plan for a business, and I had a plan for everything that I wanted to do with it, and I just kind of pulled the trigger after that and left that job the next day. And ever since then I've been doing adult work. Mm-hmm. So, but after the premium Snapchat, I started for myself. I reinvested that, started a company that helped girls sell their own premium Snapchat, which was really wonderful. Um, I got to meet a lot of incredible women that had the same ideas as me. And it was kind of my first taste of, I grew up in Tennessee, so it was kind of my first taste of like open sexual 
like views and people that were like minded like me. Um, and then after that, I just wanted to keep going. And I eventually got into mainstream porn because of all of those weird little things. So because of comedy, I'm a porn star. It's weird. And because <laughs> because your restaurant manager yelled at you. Yes, because uh, honestly, I appreciate it. I really, really do. There's Isn't a lot. Isn't it funny how like those little moments that don't feel so good in that moment end up leading you to something better? Absolutely. That's. I mean, people say all the time, it's the journey, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. Realistically, it is absolutely the journey. Every time in my life where I've been faced with like trials and tribulations, it's led to awesome decisions, to yeah. be honest. Really, really great, great parts of my life. So. Yeah. I saw a quote the other day that said, um, smooth seas does not a good sailor make. No. And I don't know why that like, and we all know this, but sometimes it's ni- nice to have things summed up in little like memes and quotes. And I was just like, that is so true. And you think about all of the difficult situations that you experienced in your life and how all of them were building blocks to make a better you. Absolutely, absolutely. A lot of people just want to get to the end of things. Yeah. Which, you know, if you just wanted to get to the end of things, then you would be at the end of your life really, really quick. Yeah. Really, really quick. Yeah. So it's all the things that happen in between it that make it worth living. It's, uh, you know, it's just, it's a very cool thought to have. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I was actually going through a lot like a a lot of career mishaps that got me to start this podcast. Like I wouldn't have started this podcast if I hadn't like been fired from Playboy and like, you know, had a little like blip in the radar with twisties. And I like literally thought I like was never going to shoot again. And I do want to say this incredible, absolutely amazing thing. And not only has it been good for you, but for the industry, this is incredible. And I'm very appreciative of you making that choice and being able to thank you to everyone that had Holly Randall do this because this is it's really rare that adult performers or people that are sex workers in general are able to have a platform where I'm not stuck in a dryer yeah oh my god oh my god wait I should do a podcast series called stuck in a dryer and then the girls stuck in a dryer and I put a micro and I have no 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 here this we go going reverse of what and I then wanted I have, and then I have an opening <laughs> and then there's a mic there and they're stuck in the dryer and then like I ask them like questions about their life <laughs> I'm telling you I feel like that's my million dollar idea it would be good that's tiktokable the 15 second little segments of that they would eat it up you're like wait a second wait a second this is like a really good idea <laughs> let's get on that set design <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. So so what was your first mainstream, like, actual real, like, big onset people around shoot? My first mainstream was with Steve Holmes mm-hmm. for Cherry Pimps. And how was that? Steve Holmes prepared me for every other scene that I could ever be in for the rest of my porn career by just purely being Steve Holmes. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how to take that. Is it, that a good or? Cherry Pimps was great to work for. They yeah. were wonderful. I really, like, you know, it was super glam, very pretty, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. Very fun. Did uh, Dean shoot it? No. Okay. No, no. Uh, I know he was working for Cherry Pimps. He's not anymore, but I didn't I know if this Scott. was before I think Scott did okay I think he shot my first scene um but no Steve I shook his hand he said because that's what I thought we were gonna do I shook his hand hi um Anna nice to meet you he said hi I'm Steve Holmes and then he said oh that ass and then dropped down to his knees and started eating my ass <laughs> immediately yeah. and I thought in my head I was like this is all right all right this is it this is what sexually explorative people do this is what this is it and I I you know, we had a great scene. He was really fun. He went. He was very gentle. Yeah. And he was great. But nobody else in my career has ever dropped down to their knees and immediately started eating, eating my ass. Yeah. So, but he really did. I'm glad for that experience. Steve, you know, my experience with him has been he means no harm. He just... He's just not always good at like. He's not. He's not asking first. He's very European. <laughs> yes. He's he's very very European. But um, I remember I shot a scene with him and Adriana Chechik for <laughs> Naughty America, 
and I like could not get them to stop fucking so I could get her yeah. fucking makeup and like get her clothes on her. And like it's funny because I was thinking to myself, I'm like, this is the porn set that everybody imagines every porn set's like, where like the performers are so into each other, they can't, st- they're fucking all day long, exactly. and like they don't have, they don't care about production or like you know, and it's normally not like that. Like you know, the girls in hair and makeup, the guys over here are like filling out paperwork, they like say hello, but they don't like attack each other right away. <laughs> <laughs> High five when we're done with the scene. Adrian and Steve is a different story. No, I uh-uh. was like, I could not like pry them apart. I was like, I need to dress her, Steve. Yes, yes, he's he's very different, and he was my first person that I worked with mm-hmm. ever. Um, that scene did really well mm-hmm. as well because it was like a petite girl, older man. Yeah, and um, I had a fun day, you yeah. know. So that was my first scene, but it definitely prepared me for anything else that could ever happen in the industry, and also gave me a good idea of how to. St- you know, say, this is what I do like, this is what I don't like. Yeah. Um, in the scene, they requested fingering, and that's something I don't do. I don't mm. like it. Mm. Not into that. Just fingernails. Ugh. The backs of them. It's not the tips. It's the backs. The backs. I can feel it. Really? I have a Are sensitive... I was going to say, you got to be really sensitive, because I'm not that sensitive, I but sensitive pussy. I don't like like the, the jabbing. Like I've literally never been fingered in a way that I enjoyed it. Ever. Ever. I've never been like, this is amazing. I'm always like, okay, like, you think this is great, so I'll just be like, I'm so glad wonderful. you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> like, oh, <my> <laughs> like can, can we do, can we move on to the next part? Yeah, but, can you just put your penis in there because, like, that's preferable. It'll feel better for you, too. This is, like, not, this is not doing it for me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the scene, it required fingering, and it actually said heavy fingering, and I looked and said, no, that's not what I'm going to do. And Steve followed those instructions very well for me. And it was, you know, it was a wonderful day. But, That's good. Yeah. That's really great. Who are some of your favorite performers to work with? I really like Manuel Ferreira. Mm-hmm. He is super intense. Um, one of the few people that I can really trust that he'll understand what I'm looking for and when to stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, people, when they're in a space where it's sexual, submissive, blah, 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 I feel like it's almost kind of an intoxicating space in yeah, general. Yeah, they call it subspace. It's su- yeah, it's, and it's, it's hard to consent, and it's hard to say what I do and don't need. And with Manuel, he knows exactly what I don't need. If I ask for more, he doesn't do more. If I need more, and I, you know, he's great. He is wonderful. So he's really good at being able to put me into that space. I really like working with Alex Jones, too. Mm-hmm. He's great. He is a super good performer, um... Big dick. Very passionate. I've actually never shot him. You should. Which is... You should. It's... it's he's you're, very... He's very good looking. You're gonna like those, it. Those eyes are... You're gonna pretty. really like it. You're <laughs> gonna like it. He's a very pretty man. And he's exactly like uh, Manuel in that way of uh, understanding women's bodies and uh, how to just say okay this is what she wants this is what and Mm -hmm. he's vocal like Mm -hmm. i love when men are vocal i love when they tell me what they do and don't want and let me do that same thing right that's all really great so those are the two people i think i like to work with the most right now but i could we could do an entire hour-long podcast of me talking about all the dicks that i like if you wanted me to (laughs) like those are just people that i've had sex with recently so they are definitely in my mind (laughs) but like they are the list of people, I am really lucky to be able to work with some wonderful performers in this industry. I, yeah. It's just the talent that I'm able to work with all the time, yeah. top tier. Do you have anyone on your no list? I'm not going to ask you for names because <laughs> I don't like to call people out, but could you maybe talk a little bit about why they're on your no list? I do have people on my no list. Um, I have a certain person on my no list because didn't follow the no fingering rule. Mm. At all. So you just felt like really didn't listen to you? Really didn't respect my boundaries. And mm-hmm. there was other things that happened, but since I've already said that, I will say that. Um, other things that he didn't respect, that was one. Yeah. So yeah. that's one of them. Another one, um, same thing. Mm-hmm. Just didn't respect my boundaries. I didn't feel like having to do that. You know, if I, I didn't want to have sex with him. Yeah. And I only have sex with people I want to have sex with. Yeah. You know, it's it feels it feels very odd talking about like my job in that way. Like I didn't want to go to work that day, but like no, I didn't want to have sex with this person yeah. because 
they're not good to have sex with for me personally. And there's a few people on there that are like that, that maybe didn't respect my boundaries. Maybe I just really didn't like it. And I just, there just wasn't that there for me. And those videos I don't necessarily want online. Right. Yeah. It's interesting because it's like, that's where the job gets a little bit murky, right? Because <laughs> It's that's where it's not like a regular job. Yes. You know, if you have a job, so say back back at your um, your other job where you mm-hmm. were a server, you can't say I don't like those people. I'm not going to go serve that table. No. Right. Like that guy's a jerk. I'm not going to like go take his order. Like you're mm-hmm. gonna you're gonna go do that because you know it's your job and you not luck him, but whatever. But with you know adult work, it's like yes, it's work. Yes, it's like you're curating a fantasy, but it is also like an intimate sexual experience that I have full choice in because right it is so my there's body. like that other layer there that that makes it not just a job and you mm-hmm. and you do get to have you know those choices and you do get to say no to certain people I was a manager at a retail shop um and there was people that would come in and just sit there and hang out with me all day and a part of my job was allowing them to do that because the more they were in there the more they would buy And I never got to say no back then. Mm -hmm. Now I can say no to anything, even if a person just makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, like a, like the best is the location owners wanting to hang out on set and watch a scene, right? Yeah, love that. that. That's like a big. That's a big one that I always have to like. I don't see that that, because the director gets rid of that before I get there. (laughs) To the point where. Even if I go and scout a location and I've never shot there before, even if the owner seems super cool, I have to just make sure they know, like, it's a closed set. You can't sit there and watch. Yeah. Like, just so you know, like, this is not a, this is not like a spectator event. No, 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 no. That's not a cinema. Because I've literally had people do that. No. I've literally had guys, like, come down and, like, just sit behind me, like, well, can't wait for the show to start. I'm like, oh, no, 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 you're leaving. Like, that's not happening. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Like, you- but all these other people are here. I'm like, they're here to work. They're not here to watch. You- totally different. And the girl feels it. Uh-huh. uh-huh. You know? I like- hope you realize that these people here are so jaded from sex in yeah. general. Like, yeah. they, they're not looking. Yeah. Like, yeah. at all. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I used to always joke, and it's so true that, you know, because I've had a lot of guys ask to, like, PA on my sets or, like, be my assistant or stuff like that. And I'm like... The only men that I want working for me on set are men who don't really want to be there. Yes. yes. I swear to God, guys who would rather, who like got into assisting or whatever because lighting, because they wanted to do mainstream, like those are the they're people great. that I want. They're, they're not people they're who so got great. into it because they want to be on a porn set. Yes, they're because so great. Because then that means usually that they have an ulterior motive. This is why Mike Quasar is so great because he absolutely does not want him either Mm-mm. he doesn't want to shoot porn which is why he's such a wonderful director he's, he's, yeah exactly you know, the people that are like I could give a shit less honestly if yeah. I'm here or if I'm somewhere doing it in a different place as yeah. long as I'm getting paid I'll walk out of the room who cares like yeah. I'm going to walk out when my job is done I yeah. don't have to sit here while you're fucking I actually yeah. don't want to you're yeah. kind of loud yeah. Yeah. like <laughs> that's it's great it's one yeah I think that's really a funny thing. Yeah, it is. It? <laughs> so ridiculous. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about some issues that are happening in the adult industry. Um, what are some of the biggest misconceptions about adult stars and so much more. So sit tight. We'll be right back. Today's dating landscape is tough enough as it is. You don't need to add extra stress to your quest for love by putting pressure on your performance in the bedroom. If you need that extra confidence to impress your new special friend, Blue Chew is here to help. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. And if the idea of seeing a doctor about your performance concerns gives you pause, you will love to know that Blue Chew is a totally discreet online service that you can access in the comfort of your own home. No trips to the doctor's office, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew is an online prescription service that gives you access to licensed medical providers who will help you determine what prescription you need. Blue Chew is made in the USA and ships right to your door in a discreet package, so nothing will tip off that nosy neighbor of yours. 
And here's the special for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code HOLLY, to receive your first month for free. So guys, if the time has come where you need a little bit of extra help in the bedroom, you can count on Blue Chew to be there for you. All right, guys, we are back. So let's talk about crazy onset experiences. Everybody's got one. Yeah. What are yours? Um, one of my favorite onset experiences would definitely have to be I was on set for a scary horror type porno mm -hmm. thing. Uh, it was a full movie, and for about eight hours of the day, I had color contacts in and I couldn't see. And there was a person that was guided to me as my guide person. Wait, you couldn't see? I couldn't see because they were color contacts and they were full white out contacts. So, so you couldn't see at all? At all for eight hours of the day. Yeah. What the fuck? It was it was an interesting day, but everyone was so nice. They were <laughs> <laughs> they were so nice and they were so accommodable. Um, I started feeling real brave after about six hours because I was like, you know what? I can kind of see. Like, it's real contrasty dark shadows, but it's I'm, – I'm, I would technically have been blind, but, like, I'm a very confident blind person after six <laughs> hours. <laughs> and I was trying to get up and walk around on my own. And every time I did, they were like, no, and would run across the room and grab me. And um, it was great. So – but for that scene, I was – we did the sex scene before, of course, uh -huh. um, and I wasn't alive during the sex scene. Do not worry. But <laughs> <laughs> for the actual movie itself, I was actually a dead person. Right. That was a figment of her imagination at this point because I had already died months before. And uh, I had to be a dead person, which included full dead person makeup and those white out contacts. So wow. that was a full day for me. Yeah. That was, wow. that was probably one of my more interesting on set stories. Did you take the contacts out afterwards and like, was the world just like bright and colorful and beautiful? And, <sighs> oh my God. I forgot what it's like. I felt like, um, did it make you appreciate? Oh my God. So more? much. Do you see, have you ever seen those videos of like the adorable children online getting Who's, like, their, the first get, time? getting their color glasses yes. for the first time? If I was so, I was, grateful to the point of feeling like that for like as close as I could feel like that for a yeah. minute of being like wow I'm so grateful for vision in general yeah. <laughs> it, it was really it was funny and another good experience I had actually another performer we were on set for an orgy that was uh it's like an interesting style orgy you're out in one room and the people hosting the orgy call you to that room so you're in a back room waiting and in that room there's gopros and stuff and you fuck while you wait and that's like the whole concept of it and when i got there i was with gia durza which i'd never worked with before but she is crazy and <laughs> yes, so she is. fun she yes, is she is. she is a freaking wild woman and she immediately started like teasing me and like not in a negative way, like teasing yeah, yeah. me in like a very sexy way, like teasing me and taunting me and in like a super sexy way. And she was like, you know, I can fist myself. And I was like, you know, I've never, I'm let, I, let's try right now. And I, we started fucking right there and they all yelled. They were like, no, into the room with the cameras. Everyone go into the room with the cameras. <laughs> so we did. And we immediately started the orgy after that. And it was because of Gia and I just, Trying to see if I could fit my fist inside of it. It was so fun. For the camera. Yes. <laughs> it was, yeah, no, it was really fun and authentic. And that's what they were trying to shoot. And they were like, no, we can't miss you initially having sex yeah. right now. Please don't do that. So she was, she was teaching you how to fist her. Yeah. And just being like, I'm a switch. I like playing both roles. Mm -hmm. So she was just being so submissive and mm -hmm. just like, you can do whatever you want to be. And I, so desperately wanted to fulfill those needs for her. <laughs> so I was like, yes, please. I will do whatever you want to you. <laughs> Is that your first time fisting someone? No, I had done it um, in my private life and mm -hmm. stuff before. I, I'm bisexual, so I've dated mm -hmm. women and stuff in my life. Uh, yeah, I've done that. You have pretty, like, small hands, though. I've, so that's, like, you know, it's yeah, good. It's compared to me. I don't know. You have a few pretty small hands, too. I don't know yeah. if I could fit this inside of me. So, 
Hmm. You know what I mean? I can't yeah. do it to myself. The angle's bad. The, I was just going to say the, the angle's angle. bad. Unless you have, like, incredibly long arms. Like, I feel like that would be very difficult. I have a hard time even using a dildo, like, yeah. for pleasure yeah. in general. Because I, I get a lot of wrist ache. Uh, <laughs> right, right. It just doesn't work out. You just walk around with, like, those carpal tunnel yeah. fucking braces on. But you're like, oh, tennis? You're like, yeah, tennis. Yeah, when I'm an old lady, I'll be like, this is where I used to fuck myself. This is, the, this is like, the muscle that stopped working because I was fucking myself. And they're like, okay, Grandma, okay, you please stop. I know, I'd love to read that, that fucking insurance claim. <laughs> um, so you won your first AVN this year. I did. How was that? And what was it for? It was incredible, to be honest. I won one for best three-way scene, and I won an, there was another one that I got as well. Um, I think it was, I can't remember. I think it was for best like movie in general for Casey. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what the actual term is, but it was with Casey. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was real. Oh, was or that was? I think that was for Expos. I think Casey won something for Expo. So yeah, Casey the, won a lot of awards. Yeah, Casey Calvert, by the way. Yes, Casey won Calvert. a lot of awards um, at Expos. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I won two for ABN. That was really cool. I mean, I thought it was really, really awesome. It felt great to be acknowledged in general. I understand, you know, it wouldn't have like hurt me if I didn't win. Mm-hmm. I understand. I understand awards and how they work regardless of what they are. But it was really cool to be acknowledged in general at all. I think that there was plenty of other incredible performers that were just as deserving of it, but it's just, it's, yeah. it's kind of cool. Yeah. It's like, it's pretty cool to have anything at all, to have them know my name at all. Yeah. You know? I mean, the good thing about the AVN Awards is they come around every year and they have like 50 fucking categories with like yeah. 20 people nominated per categories. Yeah. <laughs> like. Regardless, you're going to get a nomination Mm -hmm. and probably eventually an award. Yeah. Unless you're me, which means you'll never get one. (laughs) (laughs) I love to throw that in there whenever we talk about ABM, but totally (laughs) not bitter about it. (laughs) Not bitter at all. Don't worry. Not at all. Not at all. (laughs) Um, So let's talk about, like, the current events that are happening in the adult industry. Um, They're – so – For those of you who um, don't know, and I've talked about this so many times on my show, there was the Me Too movement, obviously, that we all know about a few years ago. And then during COVID, there was kind of like a second Me Too wave that happened within the adult industry, where a lot of women felt empowered to come forward about abuse that they had um, suffered at the hands of directors or other performers. I think that the popularity of platforms such as OnlyFans which made people financially independent, made people say feel safe. Helped them quite a bit. Could to speak be able out to because say they didn't something. they didn't weren't so concerned about being blacklisted. We had kind of like a third wave happen. Um, last week Leah Gotti um, put out a Twitter thread and, you know, basically said like talked about some of the issues she'd had and then invited people to speak about their own or to DM her privately and she would speak for them. People are calling it the list. The list. The list. Yes. So what was your reaction to that? Because I know that she got mixed feedback, which has been very stressful for her. My first reaction was worry, of course. Just anybody that is going about it in that way, which I don't think it's the wrong way. I'm not someone to judge that. But in a way where it can just be so scrutinized publicly, um, I was worried. I was very worried for her, first of all. Uh, Another reaction that I had was I was really grateful that women were speaking out in general, keeping me safe, other performers safe from coming into those same situations where we might not be aware that we need to be extra careful or Mm -hmm. we might not be aware that we just don't even need to be there at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I was absolutely very grateful to my fellow performers for not only speaking up for themselves and being very brave, but like that helped me quite a bit. There's mm-hmm. a there's several people on there that I'd heard things about, but I didn't know the extent. Yeah. And to be Same. yeah, and to be able to fully understand that is like a gift. It's a huge huge gift that I you know, that's making a big difference. Mm-hmm. That's how I think it's making the biggest difference because directors blah blah blah, they might not be listening, but for me, 
huge, huge difference in the ability to understand like who I'm working with mm -hmm. on a deeper level. Yeah. Um, and also I wish there was a better platform for these women to be able to speak out because another reaction that I had was I worry about how it makes our industry look mm -hmm. in one of those ways we were talking, you were just talking about, uh, there was a few lawsuits from like individuals that think porn should not be a thing mm -hmm. anymore. And they pulled things from online to use in those lawsuits as evidence. And I do worry that things like this, which are women that are just trying to have a platform and a voice to be able to say what has happened to them since mm -hmm. they don't have the proper one, they're putting themselves at risk of being used as one of those examples yeah. in one of those lawsuits. Yeah. It's such a complicated conversation to have because mm -hmm. it's like, yes, you know, the adult industry is like any other workforce, right? There's like, there's workplace safety issues yes. and there's um, people who take advantage of other people and there's abuse. But when it's the adult industry, these organizations such as like Exodus Cry and COSI, you know, really use this as fodder to further their agenda against the adult industry as a whole. They take... Which is not what it's meant for. Which is not what it's meant for. Like, there's the do there's that, doctors who, um, I don't mean to say something terrible, but there's doctors who rape women yes. when they're doing surgery. That happens. Yeah. There are bad people within our industry as well. Yeah. It just, it. I understand that it varies like morally for some people, but just because we're doing sex work doesn't mean that there isn't going to be good and bad. Right. Like there is, of course, good and bad. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard because it's like they really, you know, take these little moments and they use it to, you know, push their agenda that the adult industry is full of abuse and, you know, women are being victimized on a regular basis. But it's like, no, yes, yes and no. Like this happens, obviously. It doesn't happen all the time, of course, because a lot of these women that we're speaking up are active in the adult industry. I've had them on this podcast. They love their job. But also, you know, they want to speak out about, you know, bad situations that they've encountered so that other women can be warned as well. That's the purpose. And they can know. And then also, you know, to push these kind of predatory people out of the industry to make it a safer place for everyone to work in. For sexual exploration, for right. everything in general. Yeah. yeah. So it's so complicated because it's like, how do you achieve that objective? Like, how do you, you know, how do you make the adult industry a safer place to be by allowing and encouraging these kinds of open conversations mm -hmm. without outside entities coming in and using it for their own, you know, nefarious purposes. I think it's extremely unfortunate, to be honest, because it is just another way that they dehumanize us. Yeah. Because we should be allowed to say, hey, things aren't great. Things aren't going well. We, mm -hmm. you should not be working with this individual and it's, you're not going to have a good time if you do. We should be allowed to say that without being scrutinized as a whole. Right. If someone says a hospital isn't doing great, we don't all of a sudden say, all hospitals, we're done. Yeah. We're done with them all. It's just not a thing that happens. So it is another way that they dehumanize us. And it's really unfortunate that we even have to be having this conversation about it having like this dual thing that could happen. Mm -hmm. It is the juxtaposition of two different, totally different things that can happen, which is a woman feeling empowered and doing something that is helpful for her fellow coworker mm -hmm. versus her saying something that could be used against us. That shouldn't even be mm -hmm. a conversation at all. Yeah. It's it's it it's very dehumanizing. Yeah. It's and it's and it's so complicated too. I mean, you know, I can kind of cite the the recent episode that I did with Jesse Rogers, you know, who had a bad experience in the adult industry, left the adult industry, spoke out against the adult industry, you know, definitely had some of these anti-porn organizations use her story and use her Absolutely. to speak out against the industry. She left. She grew up. She changed as a person. It's been 10 years. Um, the adult industry, I want to say, like, I think almost most importantly, the adult industry has changed mm -hmm. dramatically since then in the last 10 years with, you know, these personal content platforms where girls can make their own money, um, with the changes in the way that a lot of brands do 
uh, business, um, the boundary checklists, yeah. all of that came from that second Me Too wave that I was talking about during COVID. I witnessed it firsthand yeah. working for MindGeek, you know, when all of these people were talking about directors and situations that, you know, they came across, like the executives at MindGeek were like, okay, we need to like talk about this. We need to make sure that we're creating a safe environment for these people to work in. We need to suss out some of these problematic people. I mean, there were directors who got fired. Yeah. Because Which are all incredible stories. things. That came right. These are all good things that happened out, out of, you know, unfortunate circumstances, but it really moved the needle forward, I think, in making the adult industry a safer place for people. And now we have these boundary checklists and now we have like a lot of accountability. We have talent liaisons on set that are there specifically for the models. Like all of this wouldn't have happened if people hadn't spoken out exactly. about what they were experiencing. And so when Jesse came on to my show, you know, I saw a lot of people saying like, oh my God, why is she back in the adult industry? She spoke out about the adult industry. She said all of these negative things, like you shouldn't interview her. She shouldn't come back. Like she should be banned forever. And I was like, she's allowed to have her experience. She's allowed to speak. I mean, one of her biggest issues that really like I felt very upset about was that she did try to talk to people about her, the bad experiences that she had in the industry, her agent, other people in the industry, and they all gaslighted her mm -hmm. and told her, like, well, you know, we basically we don't care or we don't believe you. So she had no support within the adult industry because this was still in a time that women didn't speak out, mm -hmm. you know, because there was no OnlyFans, there was no personal Snapchat, there was no other way to make money except to be hired by directors and brands. And so if you went and you said thing, negative things about these people, then you weren't going to get hired anymore. So, you know, I think that that really, you know, that was obviously very upsetting for her and I can see why she would see the adult industry as a whole as like a terrible industry to be in. Like 20 years ago, young. it was like a bad pimp. She was yeah. 19, Yeah, you know? And I just feel like if we really want to cultivate a space that sex workers can feel safe and they can feel like they can have good experiences, then like we need to talk about the bad stuff too. Absolutely. I mean, I always like... You know, I've even been criticized that, oh, this podcast, all you do is talk about the good stuff in the industry. You ignore the bad stories, like, which in a way, like, I understand. Yes, like, I generally tend to lean towards the positive because if you want negative stories about the adult industry, there's so much out there for you to, like, read and watch. Like, trust me, I don't need to cover those, that part because that's well covered. covered. It's yeah. well covered. But I also, like, want to acknowledge that there are bad situations and that there are like these terrible events that occur so we can talk about it so that we can try to create a space that feels better and safer for people. And that's why Jesse has come back because mm -hmm. we are different as an industry. She can be independent. She has more agency over what she does for a living. She's also older. So like she's better at setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. So like, why can't she come back? It's like, there's that. I, in that's my such opinion, bullshit, you know? It makes complete sense to me why she would leave and why she would feel the way she felt. Absolutely. I, and us having people like that come back into our industry is kind of it, it's a wonderful look. It's yeah. wonderful for us. The fact that we are able to make somebody that was so jaded and had such a terrible experience within our industry come back and say, this is actually where I want to be because of the changes that you've made. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's us mate, taking a step in the right direction and being allowed to do that because we are treated like human beings that just do a job and we need to be able to talk about those things that aren't going well with our job. Right. That's it. Yeah. It, that's it. We're, it. It's what I hope to come from this entire conversation this time is I hope that with the passive income that we're able to have, with the ability to say things on social media, with everything – us being able to talk to directors and their lawyers and their legal team directly about what has happened to us on set in general and try to come to some situation that rectifies it. I hope that we will be able to have women that are able to say no and walk away comfortably. Mm -hmm. It's... It's not the women's fault that they weren't, they didn't feel comfortable and they weren't able to say no. Sometimes you might just be young. Sometimes it could be a lot of different things. Like you said, she was younger. She wasn't able to consent for herself. We should she be looking also after had those an people. Agent who was definitely not going to stick not up. looking out for them. No. Not saying, "Hey, this is on her nose. Don't even put that on the call sheet. Don't yeah. even ask her." Yeah. Like we are to the point. My agent rides for me. 
she rides for me. For mm-hmm. <laughs> it, there is when I told her about what happened with the people that are on my no list, she put them on the no list for the whole agency for a whole year. Wow! And it's just what it, I, I'm happy. I'm glad that she did. She waited till they made the changes that they need to needed to make before she booked with them again. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm really happy to be working with the people that are with me. But to be able to feel confident and say no and walk out before that even happens is a I think what is going to happen from this Mm -hmm. I think that that is a huge step that's going to be made and people I mean that's the only way that it's not going to happen for sure is if we I the only way that I know for sure that it won't happen to me is if I protect myself Right. I can't rely. I I would like to be able to rely, rely on other people, and I do have them to rely on. But realistically, I am the one that needs to say no. And I hope that this gives the women, women in general, what they feel, or men, yeah. you know, men and women, the ability to say no. I'm not going to do this. Yeah. And if you're not going to respect it the first time, I'm sorry, but your day is done. Like, yeah. Please find another person. Yeah. And as a director, like, I really thought a lot about, you know, what people were saying. And as I was reading this thread, um, you know, because also, too, like, yes, you're right. Like, as as a woman, as, you know, the, you know, sex worker on on set and, you know, also as a man, um, ultimately only you can be the one to fully enforce your boundaries, right? Only you can rely on yourself. There should be people. However, however, there should be other people on set, such as the director. Absolutely. Who is not, who knows about your boundaries and is there to advocate for those. I mean, for me, like that's so incredibly important. Yeah. And when I was reading this and I, you know, and also there was another conversation about, you know, a director who didn't like, take somebody out of bondage when they requested it. So there was, there were, yeah, there was a lot. I don't want to name names, but I don't need to. Um, and I wasn't there and, you know, whatnot. But as a director, this really made me think, like, it made me kind of nervous because I was thinking, you know, I've been in this industry for 25 years, right, before any of these boundary checklists came in, before, you know, this new kind of culture of consent that we – or hopefully have on most sets. And I always, you know, tried to be in tune with the girl and, you know, how she was feeling and make sure that she was okay with what we were doing. But, you know, I I think at the time I relied on, like, my women's intuition, you know, like I can read the room and I can tell if, like, she's not comfortable with something. But that's not true. Like, after reading all of these accounts and everything, it's made me realize that that's not true. Like I can't be, I can't rely on, you know, my keen insight to like know what's going through someone's head. That's why I feel personally feel so grateful for these measures that we've taken to make sure that like people feel comfortable stating their boundaries, that it's all fucking written out in a checklist, like every possible thing that you can think of. Yes, no, yes, no. We all talk about it before the scene. We record it. Like there's serious accountability hanging, um, there that makes me feel safer about it because I definitely think back and think like god was there ever a time that you know on my set that somebody did something that they felt uncomfortable with and I didn't see it Mm -hmm. like I couldn't read it like I didn't know you know and I don't think so but I mean I don't know absolutely I mean and all I agree all I was saying with before was I hope that this thing that's happening on Twitter and with all of us is that it gives us the confidence to yeah. say no. I think that there should be a lot of people on set that are aware and watching if everybody is consenting and okay. Yeah. It, with that particular situation, she's a really close friend of mine, um, and she said no. Yeah. I know her. She said no. Yeah. She's vocal. She, no matter what state she is in, she said, and I heard from her directly after it as well. She said, I asked them really nicely if I could get taken out, and they didn't consent to that. And they, or they didn't say that I was able to do that. They said, can we please get a little bit more? And this is an incredible performer. One of the best in the industry right now, in my opinion. She is absolutely incredible for like her era of performer. She wouldn't have asked unless it was the very last minute that she could take it. And that was also like very, I was surprised by that and I was disappointed by that because I have cited so many times that 
companies such as that BDSM company that we're referring to basically cultivated like the boundary checklist mm-hmm. and created like that, <laughs> like that culture of, I mean, I always referred to the kink community as like, these are the people that like we need to look at in our m- vanilla mainstream industry um, and what they're doing and how good they are about consent and how good they are about boundary checklists and all that stuff. Like they're doing it right. We need to like follow what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So when that story came out, I was like, oh shit. Well, I guess not, no company's immune to these kinds of. I've been involved like, in like situations coming fetish up. Fetish stuff. They're not as, no. Yeah. There's, there's bad apples in every bunch. Yeah. There's, especially when it comes to things that consent can be given or revoked at any time. Right. So, and that for some people, uh, just, I think maybe because of upbringing or just conditioning and the world in general, it's just difficult for some people to be told no mm-hmm. after they've been told yes. Yeah. And that's just human condition yeah. nowadays. That was definitely something that I really feel like I picked up a lot on was the you can take away consent after you've given it. That doesn't w- bother yeah. me at all. If yeah. you all of a sudden don't like this, why would I want to do it? Right. I will never. And if I was in a situation not long ago where I was on set with – uh performers one of the male talent had a test that was over a day um expired so it was the 15th instead of the 14th the female talent looked at it and looked at me and then looked at it and then handed it to me because she didn't want to be the one to say out loud that this is what's going on i flat out said out loud hey this isn't okay we're not shooting with him you need to find another male talent or we're going to rebook this like no so if was this, on all, a, was this on a professional set? Yes. Yeah, so and that, through, never that should, should never have happened. Because, like, we check the tests and pass yeah. before everyone gets exactly. on set. Exactly. And if you have an expired test, you're not coming mm-hmm. to set. Exactly. Like, that, I, like, we do that before anyone gets there. Exactly. And through that, so there was mistakes on the company's end. There was mistakes on everybody else's end. Yeah. Even the performer that I was working with, she didn't even feel comfortable saying this out loud. But because of all these things that are going on and because of what I've been taught about what I can and cannot say with my sexual safety and when it comes to adult, which is anything, by the way, I'm allowed to say anything that I do and don't want to do. If anybody out there doesn't know, I can say no to anything. Mm -hmm. But um, through that, I, I, I was all that was left. And I said no, and they've completely rebooked the day, and they put new protocol in for that company because of it. And that's what I mean is, like, I hope that these women are allowed to put this impact on these companies. Twitter is one thing, but really, like, Twitter is a great thing for me. It's an impact on me as a performer because I get to see all these things. So I'm really grateful. Yeah. But I mean, the impacts the... on the company is the paycheck. Right. If right. they keep hiring people that keep fucking up talent's consent and they keep walking off set, yeah. that's where we make it stop. Yeah. They, they're not going to pay attention to anything but a paycheck. Morals. And that, that's not just like with sex work mm-hmm. or anything. That's with everything. Body, all business, all business in general, big business especially. Morals are like their side note. Yeah, what's hurting their paycheck is going to help the most, and that's what I think is going to come from this one. I yeah. think women are going to feel comfortable saying, mm, "No, you know what? That kill fee is not that bad. I'll walk out." Yeah. Or I'm not going to pay a kill fee. Yeah, I'm actually not. Yeah. It was your mistake, right? Because I didn't pay a kill fee. I got yeah. paid for the day that they yeah. th- and they that the company had a male talent come in and. Uh, that would be With insane the if they made you pay a kill. Exactly. That. I got that would be pay- insane. Exactly. I got paid for the day. I got rebooked another day. I got to pick the male talent that I worked with. They had new protocol for the company. These are all things that I didn't tweet about, so nobody really knows about it. But all of those things happened this year. Yeah. And I got the ability to, and I felt comfortable doing that because of all the things that are happening within these our industry. Yeah. And I'm active about telling my friends, hey, no, don't. If some if they even change the call sheet from the male talent that you expected to be there, you don't have to do anything. You can walk out right then. Yeah. That's their mistake. Yeah, you always have to like let the because last minute cancellations are not uncommon. Mm-hmm. But like one thing that I've always really like pushed my you know like production manager on is like the talent needs to know that the talent the other person canceled and that someone different because I don't know who is on their no list. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know who they're uncomfortable with. 
you know, like it needs to be absolutely clear. And even if you didn't know who was on their no list, it could be a certain type of scene that just, I don't want to shoot with that person. Right, right. You know, like there's yeah. so many factors. You can't just switch it up on me last minute. Right. You know, like, you know, so there's there's a lot of things that I think are going to come from this and that I think is going to be one of them for sure, where women feel comfortable and strong and powerful in saying no and know that they're making a change by saying no not yeah. just that they're going to be replaced yeah. that they're making a change because money out of a company's pocket i don't care if you got 20 followers on instagram money out of a company's pocket is going to hurt yeah yeah i mean you're right you know businesses are businesses but i i am grateful for how this has changed their practices cuz i definitely you know, I can tell you, like, as a director and a producer, like, I have had issues where I felt very uncomfortable with the way that certain brands wanted me to push something that that performer was, um, you know, unsure about. <laughs> I've felt that I've been punished and I've lost jobs mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't think that this is something they want to do. And I feel uncomfortable pushing them to do that. So I feel, like, very grateful that the culture has changed for sure. Me too. I mean, I had a situation where, and again, I won't name names. I'll I'll tell you afterwards. But there was a company that I was working for, um, and they were pretty, they were pretty, like, tame in terms of, you know, the the content that they normally put out. And then there was another producer who came into the mix who started shooting, and that producer started pushing the boundaries of the people that they were working with to stuff that was – a little bit more explicit, I guess, than what that company normally put out. And I got pressured to follow suit and do the same thing. And I was like, I don't feel comfortable doing that. The people that I'm working with, I don't think feel comfortable pushing their boundaries like that, and I don't really want to do it. And I literally was like, got jobs taken away from me and given to this other person because I didn't want to do that. Then I also found that this other producer would sometimes give alcohol Mm -hmm. to the people on set to convince them to push their boundaries Mm -hmm. in this way. And I was just like, this is fucking bullshit. Like, this is bullshit. And, um, yeah, it was really, like, disappointing and just infuriating for me. I'm like, okay, so because I don't want to push girls past, like, what they said they're comfortable doing – like I'm literally losing work because of that. That is a really, really? that's a really interesting point too, because that could be another huge thing. I mean, it definitely is another huge thing that it's going to come from this. Directors like you, who are worth what you should be getting paid, and actually pay attention to us and what we need and what how we deserve to be treated, will be getting the work rather than people that are cheap and give alcohol and make it easy for people yeah. to get like that's that's another great thing that will happen the, it will not only push out like the performers that are bad and the directors that are bad but it will bring in the good ones yeah. where that should be where they should be that's really interesting i didn't even think about that yeah so um but the, and that has changed like the last like this changed already mm-hmm. so so we're in a different space already yeah. so i haven't had that experience since like since covid you know since awesome. everything changed so like i feel fair that's what i'm saying like it's because you know we we always talk about the sex workers and the performers feeling better which obviously like that's what our focus should be because those are technically the most vulnerable people on set right yeah. um but also i will say that there's the, you know like that kind of um positive fallout on producers and directors um you know just feeling like we have we're working on safer sets exactly and we're given guidelines that will help prevent us from accidentally overstepping other people's boundaries because you don't want to be you don't want to do that i don't want to do you that. you don't want to do and that i don't want to do that on accident <laughs> yeah exactly either. should we talk about some like bullshit arbitrary shit why not should we should we lighten the load a little bit yeah um favorite colors blue and pink <laughs> who's your favorite celebrity crush i don't know <laughs> what uh penis size do you prefer um i like big if we're being honest I okay like okay yeah i mean let's we've been honest so far right I'm let's be honest. honest yeah if we're being honest i like big guys you know you don't need a big dick to do the job Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have to have big hands to give a good massage, mm-hmm. so you can give a great massage with small hands. It's mm-hmm. not hard at all. But um, I like big dick. I like uncircumcised. 
Okay. That's another question that I get up a lot too, where people are like circumcised or not circumcised. I know that some guys have like feel weird about being uncircumcised. And I mean, I've always said that like, I don't, I actually have a friend right now who has a baby, a three month old baby who is debating whether or not to circumcise him. She wanted him circumcised right away, but for some reason that didn't happen. And so she's like still kind of trying to push it. And she was asking me, she's like, what do you think? And I'm like, I mean, I think personally I wouldn't do it if I had a son. It feels like a strange thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, my parents are British, so like I come from a family of uncircumcised dicks. It's probably too much information. My brother just like thinks a lot. Um, (laughs) You didn't need to know that, but it's normalized. Yeah, that's all you. That's good. This is kind of the only country where where we do it. I think it's weird. I think it's so weird that nothing wrong with a circumcised dick it wasn't your choice you know it definitely was not your choice absolutely nothing wrong with it but when it comes to an uncircumcised dick my the friction on the outside of my vagina on those parts of my thighs where it might not necessarily get wet the inside like like uh, i can't show you but it's like right there the butt cheek vagina area like Uh the, the outside lips um that can get some friction because there's not a lot of liquid going there. A lot mm-hmm. of it's inside of me, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's there. It's I have a tight vagina, so it stays in there. Mm-hmm. It gets on where it's supposed to get, but that's it. Unless I was to physically rub it there repetitively, it wouldn't be there. With an uncircumcised dick, there's no friction in that area mm. because there is literally something keeping that from happening. Mm-hmm. And everyone's saying something about the cleanliness or whatever. That is. Ugh, that is just a that is just a reason to judge somebody else. How ridiculous is that? I could say the same thing about your ears. Like, come on. Like, no. Just like, clean your dick. Just clean your dick. That's clean just all. Clean your dick. And that's what they do. And yes. it's not that crazy. Like, if if somebody, I'm gonna go back to the ears thing. If somebody has shit in their dick and it's uncircumcised, they probably have it in all the other holes too. Like, don't worry about it. It's that person's probably not someone you should be having sex with in general. Yeah. But. Don't worry about it when it comes to an uncircumcised dude as far as, like, cleanliness. That is just, that is so wrong. Yeah. That is so wrong. It's absolutely incorrect. And yeah. Ugh, so not. Mm-mm. I've been with several Hateful. uncircumcised men, and I've never, I've never encountered, like, a dick cheese problem. I've never even seen it. Like, they're no. clean. These yeah. are clean men. Like, it's just, uh, it, 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 it body shaming. Yeah. Body shaming, which what is, I've heard that uh, uncircumcised is better for anal. Great, incredible for anal. Same concept that I just said. If I wanted to keep making sure liquid was in a place that doesn't really produce liquid in that spot was there, then that's going to be impossible. But the sleeve around the penis is great because mm-hmm. it creates no friction. Like if you have an uncircumcised dick, don't feel bad about it. It it's great. My preferred, yeah. absolutely great. Good. Thank you for clearing that up because I know that's definitely a question that people have. Yeah. I know that a lot of men feel weird about stuff like that and, like, I'm not as confident. But also, like, when it's hard, they all look the same. Yes. So. Yes. And I'm sorry, guys. Maybe I'm going to be the one body shaming, but they all look the same, not hard, too. They're all just. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry, on like the uh, that was a visual thing for the podcast. I just did my hands like an elephant trunk. They're just, like, they're they're just, just droopy, droopy things. It's things. not. It's there's not. And this is not. Like, I'm not trying to body shame, but there's nothing. They look the same. Yeah. They're droopy things, and then they're hard things. It's yeah. not. So you find them more visually appealing when they're hard, and when they're hard, like circumcised and uncircumcised. I, it it doesn't. It same. doesn't matter. I just think they look the same. They're either soft. And dangly, or they're hard and hard. It's like visually, it doesn't, you know, it's not about feeling. It's just saying they look the same. Yeah. All uh, circumcised, uncircumcised. It's you either have a soft dick or a hard dick. That's it. <laughs> That's what I see. <laughs> Do you find that like you've becoming because I know a lot of women who before they got into porn like had big vagina lips or something like that and felt very. Um, self-conscious about them until they came into porn and then they saw a lot of it and they were like oh this is actually normal and to help them feel more comfortable 
with their bodies, which is what I hope men with like uncircumcised penises feel too. They come into the industry and they're like, oh, there's a lot of like uncircumcised penises. And women are open and about talking about how they like it. You know, yes, I had a lot of vagina shame. Like a, quite a bit. I blocked it. And before I got into the mainstream, even when I was doing like the Snapchat stuff, I didn't, I tried to get rid of any stuff that was out there that I didn't want to be out there. Mm -hmm. And if my vagina was posted, I was nervous and hated it. I just, and it's not because of like sexually, I thought it was bad or morally or whatever. It's just because I had shame about my body. Mm -hmm. Like that's the only reason. And through getting in the industry, gone. Yeah. Absolutely gone. Every single person is so open and different. Like, ladies, you would be so surprised. Men have references on vaginas. Some of them like bigger lip vaginas. Some mm-hmm. of them like absolutely. things like that. They do. They absolutely do. Some of them don't care at all. And when I they found say that they most don't men care. don't care. Yeah, I, was I that. found that most men are just happy to see a vagina. Exactly, and that's what I was gonna say. But like, <laughs> if, if you're saying thinking that all men want a tiny little petite vagina, no. Some women, men have preferences on more lips, more this, more yeah. that, and feel so. Someone is looking for yours. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Someone like, is looking for your vagina. Like that it, is actually like, can I make a sticker out of they that? They are. Someone, Someone is looking for your vagina. They are. They literally are because it's it's so interesting to me that people are like, yeah, but this is not like what I imagine it being. But like, it's what he's imagined it being. He really is. What the, he loves it like that. He, uh, It's so funny. Yeah. It, and what I'll say too, as a woman who enjoys pussy in general um not very different either Mm. not very different either like navigating it sure whatever but it's all the same yeah like it it it, they're all the same but if you you if your mouth's on it then you're if your mouth's not on it and you're just looking and like studying it rather than like fully enjoying it you're doing the wrong thing and you probably don't deserve to be down there. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna say it like it is. Uh-uh. All vaginas are beautiful. They really are. And yeah. all dicks are great too. Like there's a there's shaming people for their body parts in general. If somebody was to look at like the Megan Fox thumb thing, like they everyone was like, She's so beautiful but her thumb. Because she has thumb. she has like a little tiny toe thumb. Oh. I thought it was cute as hell. A lot of other people love her little toe thumb too. So you can be the most beautiful woman in the world and people will still talk about your thumb. That's true. Like <laughs> like That's you true. know, you know what I mean? Yeah. I I have an opinion on it. Like and it's a thumb. It's a person's thumb. So yeah. don't worry about anything when it comes to your body. It's great. Yeah. I personally I think it's great. Oh, well, that's a good place to the good positive place to wrap up this show. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Every vagina is beautiful, and even if you have a toe thumb, you're still beautiful. You heard me, Megan Fox. Please, like, I will tell you every day if you want me to. <laughs> I will encourage you. <laughs> Just be shooting my shot. <laughs> oh my god. Anna, thank you so much for coming on. This has been wonderful. Thank you for having me, Holly. This was great. Thank Aww. you. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? If you Google my name, Anna Claire Clouds, it is the easiest way to find everything about me. Um, and then other than that, if you go to AnnaClaireClouds.tv, it has all the links to my social media there as well. But if you Google it, you'll find it. And, it's, and some other stuff, too. Google Twisties, Holly Randall, Anna Claire Clouds. You'll probably find the scene that we did if yes. you want it. So, yeah. Yes. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. You can also go to hollylinks.com for also all of my links, social media handles, all my websites. And of course, if you want to support this podcast and watch these interviews live streamed, go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll see you next week.